Hi everyone, here on Crushing Doubt, I love to bring on some of the best mind-body practitioners in the field to talk about their experience doing the work. But in this case, we have Elisa Batson. She is a psychiatrist, and she's also uh, certified in internal medicine, but she went towards psychiatry. She suffered from 10 years of excruciating symptoms before she could discover uh, a, the mind-body experience that was driving it through her work with Howard Schubiner. So we're going to hear about what her experience was like, how she got better, and how she works in the field. We're also going to talk about where we think the field should go, and I, I really look forward to talking to her. If you haven't already, click subscribe, ring the bell for notifications, and put your comments below. I want to hear from you about what it is you want to hear about and all of your questions. If you do ask questions there, I will get back to them directly on the site. I'm here with Elisa Batson. She is a dual trained MD in internal medicine and psychiatry and now is board certified in psychiatry. You used to be double boarded. I know you let one of those go, which makes sense given all that you're doing. And I'm so excited to have you on the show. You're based in Nashville. I know you do community mental health in, in psychiatry, but you are one of the, the people in the mind body field that I've been aware of for some time now, and we haven't gotten to connect directly. So I'm so glad to have you on and thank you for joining us. Thank you, Dan. I'm so happy to be here. Any opportunity I ever have to help help people understand what does cause chronic pain and how to recover from it, I always jump at the opportunity. Um, so I'm sure you're helping a lot of people with this podcast. Well, it's certainly my hope. And, and one of the things that, that I like to bring to the table is all the different narratives that we get from uh, pain sufferers with testimonials, whether they've worked with me or not, it doesn't matter to me. I want people to hear the stories of recovery or even the stories of struggle because we need to hear both. And one great thing about talking to you is that you can bring both to the table because, you know, I'm I'm telling you as if you weren't there. You were the one who knows it well. But in, in researching what happened for you, you had a 10-year battle with a lot of excruciating symptoms. And I'm sorry you went through that, but uh, if it was anything like my eight-year struggle, it was incredibly miserable, punctuated by a huge change. Mm -hmm. And so t tell us what you went through in those 10 years. Well, um, you know, these things start out small and then they grow over time. Um, when I first experienced my first pain symptom in my adult life, um, as I look back from this point in time, I realize I had had various symptoms since childhood. Um, but you don't realize that that's what's going on at that time. And you just soldier forward. And, um, I was a survivor like so many of us. And, um, so when I had my first sort of life altering pain as an adult, um, it was when I had started my first job as a physician and I was at work. Uh, new job, new bosses, new responsibilities, fresh out of medical residency, um, just moved back to town, um, a lot of things going on in my life. And, um, and you, you, you were how old when that happened? Uh, I would have been, uh, this would have been 2003. So I would have been uh, 30, sorry, 40, uh -huh. 40. We, we started our pain in the same year. Is that right? That's, yep, 2003. It was a wow. it was a good big year for pain in the mind body community apparently. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so I was at work and I was just doing my job, seeing patients and I was um uh the setting was that it was the beginning of the electronic medical record. And, you know, this was when uh computers had sort of come online and so to speak and uh, we were being told that there would no, be no more hard copy charts and everything had to be done in the computer. So, but at the same time, the systems back then were not sophisticated. And uh, mm -hmm. so we, as physicians, we found ourselves on the computer a lot. Um, and I found myself on the computer from 4 a.m. until midnight every night, trying to oh. type up letters to my patients and review labs and write notes. And it was really uh, a disaster from my point of view. And it took away the time that I spent with my patients, which is why I had become a doctor. So it was very frustrating. And um, I remember feeling like I had become a secretary, like I had gone from this 
having this MD degree to all of a sudden being a secretary again. And I, I remember feeling very frustrated about that. Um, there were other work frustrations um, with my situation. Essentially, I didn't like my job and I felt overworked. And in that setting, one day at work while I was filling out another form, um, I, a sharp shooting pain shot through my right elbow, just bam. And it made me drop my pencil. And I was like, whoa, wow, what just wow. happened? That's weird. Um, and, you know, thought it would go away, no big deal. But it didn't. And it began to spread down my forearm and into my hand. And then one month later, while I was at a medical conference, which I also didn't want to be at, interestingly, <laughs> I was carrying a heavy briefcase in my left arm. And bam, the exact same pain shot through my other elbow. And I was like, okay, what's going on here? And um, so both of these pains uh, began to spread. They seemed to come on to me whenever I would try to type on the computer um, or write, interestingly. And um, after um, a few initial evaluations by my primary care physician, who also happened to be my boss, which was not a good situation, um, I was diagnosed with a repetitive strain injury from computer usage. And that made sense at the time because, you know, we knew very little about computers and, you know, what what this was going to do to our bodies. Um, there was a lot of fear around that, I think. And so repetitive strain injuries were very popular at that time. And they're less popular as a diagnosis now that computers have invaded our lives so much that we really have no choice <laughs> anymore. Yeah. Everyone would be crippled if right. everybody had computer related injuries. Yeah. Yeah. Imagine exactly. Zoom related yeah. injuries of the eyeball. That that's that's coming exactly. next. <laughs> and and that brings up a good point. You know, I wondered why am I getting the one getting the injury at work? All these doctors, all these people all around me on the computers all day long. Yeah. Why am I the one that has sustained an injury here? But at the time I didn't have an answer. It's wonderful though, and I, I can hear how this ended up happening in your struggle. It's wonderful that you were able to ask those questions. I say this a lot of the time that the way we get out of this is to ask the scientific and logical questions. Mm -hmm. It doesn't, you know, a lot of these things don't make sense when we look at it. I asked the same question. I was like, why my, my pain started when I was 28 years old. And I thought, why is, why are all my peers totally fine? What, what's happening to me? And I just, I had no explanation for it. And I, and I, when I first went to doctors, I thought, well, they'll know. And they didn't. And you were a doctor and you had been trained and none of your training related to this. So you had that. And then you also had the fact that I really feel for doctors at the same time because they're really, they're doing their best, but they're not getting this training. Mm -hmm. They don't know it's there. And then on top of it, the job uh, I, I don't know what the, the state of the job is like now, but it having moved towards all of those medical records and not enough time with patients, when you make a job like that not gratifying, I could see how you could get into into that kind of pain. And then, uh, I'm sorry, go ahead. No, I was just going to agree with you. I mean, you know, it's a lot of stress. You're trying to heal people and you're responsible for people's lives and then you're having to worry about these details. Um, but... um yeah, I, I mean, I agree that um, you, you ask yourself, why me? What is going on? There has to be an explanation. And then you begin searching for that explanation, expecting to find an answer, but rarely finding any gratifying answer. And then it can get really confusing because I, so I read you, you did a, an interview on Curable. And there was an excerpt that they actually had on the front page. When I listened to it, there, there was a lot of very compelling material in that. But I read this and I was like, whoa. So um, my my pain was pretty consistently lower back with like an upper back uh, pain in like this one muscle that I started to call the eel muscle because it would spasm <laughs> like a, an electric eel and it hurt that badly. Yeah. But it was typically that. I had had a lot of somaticizing in my life. But I read this this paragraph and I was like, oh my God, I cannot believe what this woman has been through. So I just want to read it out loud if that's okay. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, it started out with the bilateral forearm pain and subjective weakness, and then it spread over months and years to neck pain, shoulder pain, jaw pain, hyperacusis, which is sound sensitivity where the slightest noises became painful to your ear. This was the one that jumped out at me most. You had multiple cracked teeth, headaches, muscle spasms, all kinds of musculoskeletal pains, uh, rectal muscle spasms, skin rashes, multiple food sensitivities, hand tremors. And by the eighth or ninth year, you showed a lot of fortitude to getting to that point without having crippling panic attacks and anxiety. But then those came in. And I love this statement you made. Even though I was a psychiatrist, I really did not have an appreciation for how terrifying, terrifying severe anxiety and panic t- attacks are until I developed them myself. So often this is the case, because when I talk to people about my back pain, uh, they would generally be very uh, empathic. But I found that the whole world didn't get it unless they had had it. And that, right. that's a, it, can be, it can make for a very lonely period and a confusing one i when i read the amount of things you went through i mean i've heard of all of these things in mind body work and i've experienced a lot of them in isolated form but yours was like jumping around from one thing to the next Mm -hmm. yeah and i think that just reflected my state of fear you know my the danger signal in my brain was highly turned on and yeah and it did move around my body and created all kinds of symptoms and um, they were quite devastating and the anxiety and panic was just the worst. Um, and we, as you said, we don't learn any of this in medical school or residency. I was, you know, dual boarded in internal medicine and psychiatry, but no one at any point in my training had even suggested that one's emotional state could cause real physical symptoms in the body, much less make them worse. I mean, you know, we just don't learn this. It's not part of the uh, education. And, um, and we, unfortunately, we don't often appreciate what patients are going through um, because we don't understand it. Yeah. And, and, you know, this, this term of stress gets thrown around a lot Mm -hmm. um, where people say, well, stress can cause this stuff. And that's a start. But what I find is that being that general about it, not understanding that there really is a thing where it starts in your head and it becomes real in your body. Mm-hmm. You've got pain receptors firing, you've got muscles spasming. I mean, it's all real. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I, just, I couldn't, I couldn't believe it. I knew I had a lot of emotional trauma because I had been there for it. Mm-hmm. Um, but it, even I, I mean, I, I grew up in a family of psychoanalysts. So I was, it was not foreign to me that the mind um, could cause you a lot of emotional pain. Right. But the idea that it can cause physical pain. Right. And of that magnitude was just shocking. And I remember also thinking, I don't know if this happened to you, but uh, when Sarno was recommended to me and I finally read him and it started changing my perspective, I thought, how is it that no one, no one in my life knew about this? So it's interesting because you're saying in medicine, you don't get trained in it, but in life, we don't get trained in it. No, And no. that's that's one of the reasons I'm doing this podcast is this has to be talked about. We have to change the national discussion so that it's really a part of how people are thinking about it. Right. It should be part of the doctor's evaluation from the moment the patient walks in the office. I mean, why yeah. set aside the possibility that a person's physical symptoms could be caused by something going on in the mind or the brain. Why, why wait until the last minute after everything else has been done to consider that factor? Why not consider it in the beginning? Sure. You've got to, you've got to rule out life threatening or serious medical conditions, but this should be part of the ongoing discussion between a patient and their primary care physician at all points in time. How is your emotional state? How are things going at home? How's your job doing? I couldn't agree more. And I I like the balance that you strike because of course, with life-threatening issues, we need the MDs. They're the ones who know how to help. And so this is by no means throwing doctors under the bus. They, They have that role. And in fact, it's saying just what you're saying, which is we've got to bring the doctors into the fold. Mm hmm. Yeah. If they can know, and I just, I love the idea of not just having it as the last rule out. You know, right. Let's include right. it 
in what we're talking about. Right. And this is the way medicine used to be practiced. This isn't new. It's only that we've right. forgotten about it in the 21st century. And in 1920, there was an article published in JAMA, the Journal of a, the American Medical Association, and um, by Dr. Francis Peabody. And he was a highly regarded uh, professor in a medical school. Um, and uh, he would lecture to his students. He was very famous, very well loved. And he would tell his students on a regular basis you do not know your patient until you know what they do, what's going on at home, what kind of environment they live in, what worries they have. Only then can you understand why they're here in the hospital. He wow. said this, it clear as day. He was talking about psychophysiologic disorders, not only as an entity, but, a, but how common they were. This was a standard yeah. lecture. This wasn't a lecture on some unusual condition. He understood that everything that goes on in your life and has gone on in your life can contribute to uh, your brain's uh, level of safety and how you perceive the world. And that can get translated through your sympathetic nervous system and through learned neural pathways in the brain to real physical symptomatology in the body. So let me ask you this. Um, how do you think we lost that knowledge? Because I agree with you, we had, and I know, and I know about this. We had that knowledge; it's been true throughout medical history, going back to you know even like the 1400s, where they didn't know some things, but they knew a lot of stuff. How do you think we lost track of this? You know, I, I think that we became so enamored with um, the new discoveries, which were very helpful and very effective. Antibiotics were discovered; uh, they were able to cure diseases for the first time ever in the history of man. Yeah. Um, uh, then we develop the ability to see inside the body with x-rays. And once we develop right. the ability to see inside the body, we started seeing things that, um, were a little bit different between one person and the next. And so we began to question whether or not these things that were different on one person's spine versus another person's spine could actually be the cause of their pain or their illness. Um, that's quite powerful to be able to see inside the body and to be able to cure um, illnesses with antibiotics. We developed more drugs and we, we began to take this very reductionist view of the body and the brain. And, and you know, to this day, we're taught that the, everything you know, in the brain is separate from the body. Um, and, uh, and so even you know, psychiatrists who are in training, they don't really, uh, it's a little bit separate from the rest of the medical world for some reason, which I don't understand. And so that's why I got dual trained was because I felt like I felt fundamentally, even back then, even before I developed chronic pain, that this was a false dichotomy, this separation between the brain and the mind and the body. You know, it can't just cut off at the neck. Um, there yeah. has there's constant communication. And so what does that mean? Why should we get trained in one or the other? That doesn't make any sense. Um, I didn't know at the time why it didn't make sense, um, <laughs> but I felt like both were important. And and interestingly, I just then I went through a ten year journey that taught me why it makes sense. <laughs> yeah. Now, now I can teach that, but um, yeah. Tell us, tell us how it resolved for you. Well, um, you know, after. I eventually was not able to work because I couldn't type. Um, and I, the, I realized being a doctor, I realized that the conventional medical world was not going to offer me anything. I knew what they had to offer. All they were gonna do is label me as a chronic pain patient um, or a difficult patient. Doctors were beginning to roll their eyes when they would see me coming and that was terrifying to me. Um, yeah. And I'm sure most chronic pain patients feel that from time to time that they don't know what's going on, but they're not really being very supported by their doctors. Um, so I felt like I had to leave the conventional medical world and delve into the alternative medicine world, which I did for several years, tens of thousands of dollars out of pocket. I tried every treatment under the sun and that also did not work. And I realized that the alternative medicine world was actually just doing what the conventional medical world was doing. It was breaking down the body into its parts and offering just different treatments. 
Um, but yeah. it was still looking at the body as, you know, solely a, um, a physical structural based structure and not, even though there was a lot of lip service paid to mind body and holistic care, um, that's not how it's practiced. Um, it's not practiced to for patients to be able to uh, learn that you, the mind's affecting the body and vice versa. So um, I got very, very lucky. I was limited because my pain would come on whenever I be on the computer. So I couldn't spend hours on the computer searching for an answer. And so I think for several years, I just didn't recover because I didn't have the opportunity to look for different answers. Um, yeah. But eventually a, uh, an old physical therapist, uh, just, I called my physical therapist up and I was in a real state at this time. I was crying. I was just so desperate, so tired, so exhausted. And, mm -hmm you know, wondering if she could think of anything that could help me. And it was a miracle. She said, Elisa, I don't know what's wrong with you, but I had another patient who recovered by going to this website. I've never been to the website. I don't know what's on the website, but maybe it'll help you. That's all she hmm. said. And then she gave me the website and the name of it was unlearnyourpain.com, which is Dr. Howard Schubner's website. And I almost didn't go to it because I thought, oh, my goodness, I can't do one more treatment. I can't look down one more road. I just have no more energy for this. But, of course, you know, ultimately you sink or swim. And I've always been a pretty good swimmer. So I uh, <laughs> got back up off the couch. I went to the computer, looked it up. And within literally 10 minutes, I absolutely knew that I had found what was wrong with me. It was, it was unreal. The website described me, described my personality, mm. described my stressors, described my past, described my, the nature of my pain and what I was going through, what I had been through with all these doctors. It, it didn't even know me, and it, but it did know everything about me. So, um, so I immediately was like, wow, I better, I better look into this. And I picked up the phone and I called the number on the website and it's uh, it's actually Dr. Schubner's uh, hospital, the number, but it was funny because on that day, um, the receptionist had been out. And so she forwarded the phones into his office. And so he answered the phone <laughs> and I was direct, like, oh, direct to him. <laughs> I was like, I didn't know I was going to talk to you. That's crazy. I mean, but, you know, I was embarrassed. I was like, Oh, I'm so sorry. I'm interrupting you. And, um, and I told him my story. He listened to my story and he said, you absolutely have this. This is what you have. You have a psychophysiologic disorder. Uh, this is treatable. This is curable. And uh, here's the treatment. This is what I recommend and good luck. And wow. I ended up getting a therapist uh, and a pain trained therapist. And we started therapy and within two months, I was on my road to recovery. It was amazing. It's incredible. And you said a lot of things in there that I just wanted to note um, and highlight. Uh, first of all, you, you said uh, it's called psychophysiologic disorder. This is another term that is used for this. Yes. Some people call it mind-body syndrome. Some people call it TMS, tension myositis syndrome, which is what Sarno called it. It's all the same thing. It is the, the mind and how much, I mean, I think of my body as just an extension of my brain. It, that's mm -hmm. how much I believe in the connection. You're right. It, it's it more is. than a connection. It's just the same. Yes. But, um, you know, you were saying that, uh, first of all, a lot of this had to do with fear. It sounds like you came to see that. And, and so my podcast is called Crushing Doubt. And fear right. is basically the emotional form of doubt. Right. When you're, when you don't know what's happening, it's terrifying. I mean, how right. are you supposed to feel anything but hopeless right. and terrified? Right. And I don't, I, I say to everybody to crush doubt, you first have to let the doubt in crushing doubt mm -hmm. has the double meaning. I'm not asking anybody to just not doubt that doesn't work. No, uh, no. But one thing you said that really jumped out at me is the thing that seemed to be the clincher for you was actually the same thing that was for me, which was being described on a page by someone who had never met me. <laughs> and I was better described on that page than people who knew me directly. I was like, <laughs> who are these people? That's right. 
<laughs> you know, um, yeah. that that changed everything for me. That made it so that I, I was like, whoa, this has some real merit to it. Mm-hmm. And then as I looked into it, the science matched up. The mm-hmm. logic matched up. Mm-hmm. It matched up with my experience where nothing else had. It was like right. nothing was making sense. Uh, I, I use this analogy a lot that when they were trying to discover the, the orbits of the planets, first they had to figure out that the sun was not revolving around the earth. Then they then they thought it was uh, concentric circles, but the stars didn't align right maybe mm-hmm. 80% of the time. But they were like, what's with the other 20%? And then Kepler came along and said, they're, ellip- they're ellipses. And then it was 100% right. That's how it felt when I discovered the mind-body work and not everybody's going to feel that right away but i mean it came to feel that way yeah yeah and patients all always ask me you know what if i don't believe this you know is that going to interfere with my treatment and and it's interesting because historically in medicine we would always say no if if the treatment works you don't have to believe in it it's going to work anyway you know you don't have to believe an antibiotic is going to work in order for it to cure your staph infection however This is different because the mind is so involved. And I love the title of your show, Crushing Doubt, because you don't have to believe it now. So don't put that pressure on yourself. But ultimately, as you as you practice these skills and techniques to change these neural pathways, uh, you'll make a little progress. And that progress is going to give you more confidence in the diagnosis and then that confidence is going to help you a little bit further along the road to recovery. And it's going to be a reinforcing, um, a reinforcing circle at that point. But, but ultimately, you really do have to come to the conclusion that your symptoms are caused by the mind because doubt, if you doubt the diagnosis, that means the alternative is that you believe that you do have a structural problem in the body, that your body is broken. And if you believe that even a little bit, that's terrifying. Yeah. Who wants a broken body? I don't want a broken body that I can't fix. So it's automatically a fear thought. So yeah. to the degree that you doubt the diagnosis, I say doubt equals fear and fear equals pain. Yeah. That's, that's so again, you don't have to believe it right away, but but over time you have to be able to convince yourself that this really is what's going on because that's the only thing that's going to turn off that danger signal and that fear response, which is yep. driving the pain. And one thing that I am fond of saying to people is the good news is you will come to believe this because it's true. Right. <laughs> that's right. Um, yeah. And I, I yeah. say, listen, you could take as much time as you need with it. I'll answer any questions you want. The fact that I'm not afraid to answer any question or I'm not afraid of any question or of any doubt, it's like, it's like if people said, well, listen, I'm not sure if I believe in gravity, but if you say so, (laughs) I'll listen to you for a little while about it. And I'm like, that's fine. We'll just keep dropping things on the ground and it'll, they'll keep falling. I, you know, I don't have to worry about proving something that is, that is true. Right. Um, but I think you're right. Each, each person has to figure out their way of becoming certain about this Mm -hmm. and that takes the questions and it takes the doubt you let you let it all in and i say Mm -hmm. to them look it's not your job to convince yourself it's actually my job it's your job to listen and Mm -hmm. to factor it in Mm -hmm. and to consider it i was struck by one other thing that you said before i thought this was so interesting but um when we were talking about how we came to this point how medicine lost its way or we as a society because i think society followed the leadership um, to these points where we didn't understand what was happening and we were seeing the body as a separate lump of clay, you know, in a Cartesian problem. Descartes started this all. <laughs> we can get to him some other time. But the the idea that we would see inside other people and say, oh, what, you look different on mm-hmm. the inside. Mm-hmm. It, it suddenly occurred to me as you were saying this, we don't do that with people's faces, Mm-mm. We don't look at your face and say, well, right. your face looks different than mine. So there must be something wrong with you. <laughs> That's right. You know, That's a good point. That's we, right. we don't do that. No. And so no. I, I understand the potential logic of it. Mm-hmm. But the fact is we all look different on the inside too. Mm-hmm. You know, we're, we're, we're unique. And I love the idea that what has ended up happening is we've started to study asymptomatic people so that we can see these structures 
are actually incidental it, yes. it, uh, most yeah. of the time. Yes, and that's really exciting research that has been done um, in several cases already where um, we now know that all of these findings that we have on back MRIs, shoulder MRIs, knee MRIs, hip MRIs, um, these differences are just normal aging of the spine and joints. And it begins in our 20s. It doesn't, mm -hmm. it doesn't take a major car accident or falling off a cliff to get an injury. It just begins in the 20s. Um, and it's like gray hair or bags under my eyes um, my goodness, I'm 58 now, and I'm I'm very used to my, my body is changing over time, and that's okay. Mm -hmm. And my spine is changing over time, and that's okay. Um, all of these findings we are seeing in older people who have never had back pain, the same yep. rate as these findings, and they've never had back pain. People who have never had shoulder or knee pain have these findings on MRI. Um, so it's not these findings causing the pain. Um, it's just an incidental finding. Right. And, you know, I think because uh, we are among some of the leaders in the mind-body field and we need to keep this going, we need to help people understand this, it's, it's something we need to work on to change the national conversation so that people really understand that. And thankfully, it's starting to happen. The American College of Physicians, I believe it was in 2017, released a statement saying, listen, we do not know how to treat back pain in, the, in that particular instance or chronic pain. Mm -hmm. um, and, and that's a start to the discussion because we've got right. to admit we have a problem right. before, we can, before we can resolve it. Right. And I did just want to say, I'm, I'm grateful for people like you who suffered through that time, but mm -hmm. stayed, stayed with trying to understand it. That's the key. That's what you got to do for yourself. Mm -hmm. Because to conquer doubt, you really do have to ask all of your questions. Mm -hmm. Your questions are legitimate. They make perfect sense. But as we look at this, and this is what happened for me, Elisa, and I think it really happened for you too. As we looked at it, it actually, I look back on it and I think everything else sounds completely crazy to me now. <laughs> um, by comparison, because oh, this that's, explains everything. That's right. Yeah. Now, when, when you look back and you you remember, you know, the physical therapist telling you that one hip was higher than the other, or or part of your pelvis was more forward, or your spine was a little bent, or your shoulders were forward, and all of these all of these uh, things they said to make you think that your body was somehow broken and would never be okay. It seems absurd now. You know, we have so many muscles and tendons in our body. We are designed. We are designed from the beginning to be flexible, to be resilient, to be strong. We're not designed to be fragile. And we're not fragile. I couldn't have said it better myself. And so I'm going to let us end on that note. It's a great message for the people who are watching and listening. We are not so fragile. After millions of years of evolution, we didn't end up being this this fragile. No. And and furthermore, we didn't go through millions of years of evolution to have our brain not able to make a pain in your body. I, I think the brain is capable of that. Well, I was just going to say, you know, it's a protective mechanism. The, the brain thinks yeah. it's helping us. It's trying to help us. It's just miscalculating the danger in our modern world. Uh, it's used to dealing with tigers and dinosaurs and snakes. Uh, our modern right. world is presenting challenges that that it, it just doesn't know how to interpret correctly. Yes, yeah, virtual tigers and dinosaurs and snakes. That's right. <laughs> and in the me in the meantime, it's also trying to communicate to us, and we need to learn how to how to understand the language. But if nobody's helping us, we won't have any way out. So, Elisa, I, I appreciate you coming on. Hopefully, we can have you back sometime. I, I know you do great work. I've heard through the grapevine about it, but even just hearing the way you talk about it, I think people would be in such good hands with you. Oh, thank and you. And I just appreciate you coming on. Let's keep in touch. Thank you, Dan. I appreciate it. Thank you for having me. This was fantastic. All the best. All right. My pleasure. You too. All right. Bye-bye. What a pleasure it was to have Elisa on the show. Uh, I'm always impressed when I talk to people. She's somebody in the, in the field that I knew of, and we had traded some emails before, but I'd never gotten to meet her directly. 
I'm always struck by how lovely these people are, but I'm also struck by just how much they know. And sometimes it's things that shed some light on something or, 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 or um, inspire something in me to understand something in a new way, which happened during this interview. But then there are also times where it's just so validating. Somebody who understands very much what I understand and when I'm presenting uh, these interviews to you, the audience, I love that you guys get to hear about the consistency of things, but also a wide range of ideas on why this is so important and why it's true. So I was thinking first about the fact that Elisa suffered for 10 years without having any idea what this was. And she went through all these different symptoms. And she is the person in the field who has the story that is the most similar to mine in that I went through that too. I had eight years, so she's got me beat by two years, which I, I'm i amazed by. Usually I'm the longest running of the of the people treating in the field at the very least. Um, but we both had the experience of no one in our lives knowing about this and having not been told about it. Uh, you know, she, uh, sounds like she was 40 when, when her onset, uh, hit, I was 28, but we both had the same experience of, we don't know what's happening and no one knew we started in the same year. (laughs) Um, and little did I know if I had talked to her, you know, two years before she discovered her, her, uh, her solution, I could have helped her, but, um, you know, we've been on similar paths And we're now helping people in the same way. One thing I was struck by is how much uh, fear Elisa had. And it makes perfect sense. I mean, when you heard me read off the list of things she suffered, how would you not be terrified by that? But one of the reasons I think it's very uh, illustrative of some things that are, are important for us to think about is that fear tends to lead to a a ramping up of symptoms. The symptoms get worse and worse and worse. If that's happening, you're in a a kind of fear spiral. And they're very hard to get out of without having someone like Elisa or me who can say, listen, this is a mind-body issue, and we know how to deal with this. And you don't have to do it alone. But I I thought in hearing her story, she captured the aloneness of it, the terror of it, the hopelessness of it. And it's very hard to believe that you're going to get out of it. Now, here's another point that she made that I think is really important, which is this is not like taking antibiotics for an infection. If you don't believe in antibiotics and you take them and you have an infection, the antibiotics will still work. But this is a mind-body issue. And as a result, the mind is part of the problem. And as a result, the mind needs to be enlisted to help. If there is doubt, even the slightest bit, you're going to get stuck. And you are not being asked to not have any doubt right from the start at all. In fact, as I always say, bring as much doubt as, as as you can or need to, because that's real. And it's your brain that is working with this issue. We have to help you come to terms with what's happening, see that the science and the logic and your experience all add up. And I'm very confident it will because it does. So the idea is that you can get to certainty eventually. Certainty eventually. Not certainty right away. You're not expected to have that at all. That would be weird. It wouldn't work. You'd be faking it. So... Those are some of the main things that I got out of talking to Elisa. I'm looking forward to more collaboration with her um, and learning from someone like her. She knows all kinds of things. Everybody in this field is so well-versed in so many different aspects. And she and I didn't get to talk much about her way of treating versus my way of treating. So if I can have her on again, and I hope to do so, we will get to hear about that. Uh, but it was a pleasure having her on. Thank you guys for watching. Please put your comments below. I'd love to hear from you and I will get back to you right away if you just leave those comments. Thanks again for watching. We'll see you again soon.